Thank you very much, uh, Eric uh, Robin. So, very warm welcome. And we already see the chair of tonight, uh, Marianne uh, de Stolk, in our screen. Um, just before I give over the floor, so this is a webinar on a very important topic hard to engage in assertive care. And in fact, it's hard to engage is one of the thematic groups that we have in UCOMS. We have here, you see the seven thematic groups that we now have in UCOMS and the webinars that we already organized this year and that we are going to organize in the year to come of UCOMS will all be around these themes. So we had the peer support meeting already in January. We had a meeting on flexible sort of community treatment in Norway and the West Balkan that was done in, uh, in April. And tonight it's about hard to engage and we on the stove will be our chair. And other upcoming webinars will be on e-health prevention, network psychiatry, and models of care. So many more webinars will follow this one, and you're very welcome to join all of them. Um, now, um, so that was the idea, uh, but this, but you just haven't seen. But so I will now give over uh, the floor to Marianne de Stoop to open this meeting. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone from Belgium, uh, Antwerp. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Eric Robin uh, for the musical opening. Uh, Eric is a peer expert in our organization. And tonight, he will play two songs that he composed himself. The first song that you heard was Pittig in Vijf Acht. I can't translate it in English, it's just uh, meant to be in Dutch. Um, I also want to thank uh, René Keet and uh, UCAMS uh, for the opportunity to present different projects uh, focusing on hard to engage and engagement in Antwerp. Um, I'll start the presentation now, just a moment. I'm going to share the screen. I hope everyone can see the screen now. Okay. okay. Um, so as stated in the UCOMS consensus paper, um, the main principle for good community mental health from the perspective of public health is to provide community mental health care for all citizens in catchment area, including existing clients, but also for clients who need care, but are hard to engage. Uh, as you can see here um, on the slide, uh, it's one, it's the main principle actually um, in the consensus paper. And moreover, in the consensus paper, it is stated that care for persons who are hard to engage should be a core task of community mental health teams. That's why in Antwerp, the last decade, we especially focused on this uh, vulnerable group of hard to engage clients. And this focus uh, led to different projects such as SEGA, uh, mobile team for uh, homeless people, Cadence, and uh, at, uh, at the end also Cadenza 4. Tonight, we're proud to present these different projects, including some data and uh, client experiences 
which are, uh, will be presented in two movies. The first speaker I'm proud to present is Ellen Bergmans. Uh, Ellen Bergmans works as a PhD student and clinical psychologist and is specialized in hard to engage and engagement. She will present the concepts of engagement, um, also her study protocol and the assertive outreach uh, project uh, SEGA. Okay, Ellen, you can come over and I think, yeah. So good evening, everyone. My name is Ellen Bergmans and I will uh, tell you something about assertive outreach and engagement tonight. So in, in general, we see um, that a certain group of clients are um, difficult to engage. Um, um, who are these individuals? It are people who have um, a severe mental illness and uh, who require uh, treatments, but um, actually um, they have difficulties in finding their way to mental health care services or they disengage from these services and drop out. And we see that up to one third of uh, people with severe mental illness um, drop out of uh, care. So especially those with um, the most uh, severe uh, psychopathology. And we also see that um, it's actually typically in the initial phase of the treatment. So why these people disengage? Uh, the reasons are yeah, very diverse. Uh, for some, it's about perceived utility. And uh, for others, it's more uh, an attitude about attitudes. Uh, for example, perceived stigma um, about the diagnosis, or uh, for example, the expectation that they won't be listened to and um, would be misunderstood. Or sometimes it's also about practical issues. Uh, for example, a lack of time or um, a problems with transport. So the reasons are very um, diverse, but why is it important to reach out to these clients? Um, we see that if there is no contact, there is more social affliction and also higher levels of impaired functioning. Um, assertive outreach as a, a service delivery model is uh, especially developed for this um, client population and um, it has uh, the next key principles. So it's about high intensive um, care in, in the community. So it's not an office-based uh, model. Uh, the key workers go to the environment of the clients. Uh, the service is delivered by a multidisciplinary team. So the key workers have different um, professional backgrounds and they use a uh, holistic approach. So there is not a uh, focus only on psychiatric treatment, but um, there's also help provided, for example, uh, for social problems or uh, physical health problems. So um, the help that they provide is very diverse too. Because we see that the population also have uh, very complex and diverse needs. And that's why there's also a focus on uh, continuity of care. So to prevent actually fragmentation of, uh, of care. And the assertive uh, engagement part is that uh, the assertive outreach team doesn't wait until the client will ask for help, but they actively go to the, the, the clients and um, see what they can do. So assertive outreach um, is, a, is a very, um, popular service uh, model. It started in the 80s um, and is uh, developed by Stein and Test in Wisconsin in the US. And um, the last two decades, it has been implemented around the world. 
And uh, this is because of the results, the initial results in the US of, of studies in the US were very positive and, and promising. But we see now in the last two decades that studies outside of the US um, have less um, clinical and, and cost effective um, results. So um, there are a couple of explanations, uh, possible explanations. And that is that assertive outreach teams included in these studies outside of the US have a low fidelity to the original assertive outreach model, or that the control condition of these studies have a high standard of uh, community mental health care. So what should we do with, this, uh, with these contradicting results? Um, because now it's, it's difficult yeah, to draw conclusions um, of, of uh, the, the, yeah, the promising results of, of assertive outreach. And that's why it is suggested that the next generation of assertive outreach, outreach research should focus on the content of, of treatment and also on um, individual elements of care. And that's where the um, concept of engagement comes into the story, yeah, because um, engagement is actually a core ingredient of assertive outreach and also a main aim of this service yeah, to reach out to this very vulnerable um, population. So if we zoom in on engagement, the concept of engagement, Actually, the research is also in a very early stage and there is still um, a need to examine the structure of engagement and also to better understand it. A recent um, systematic review of this concept defines it not only as a state, a state this means somebody is engaged or is not engaged, but they, only, uh, they also define it as a co-constructed process between a key worker or clinician and a client. And this means, this definition means that we should uh, look at engagement as a more complex and multidimensional construct with, with different aspects. But also uh, this means that the clinician plays a very important role in this co-construction, uh, in this process of co-construction. And uh, we can see this um, in, on an organizational level uh, that the clinician plays a very important role, but also on an individual level. But I will come back to this later um, in my presentation when I tell you something more about the um, practice of assertive outreach. So, Marianne already told uh, you that I uh, am doing research and in my research I, um, I try to better understand the process of engagement in the setting of assertive outreach and also um, to try to enhance the um, interventions that we use to reach out and engage clients. So my research um, is done um, with the research group Clinical Psychology of the KUL. It's uh, the University of Leuven. And my supervisor is Patrick Leute. He and his colleagues are uh, specialized in uh, the population of difficult to engage clients. And mostly they use the framework of uh, mentalization. Um, and then Marianne de Stop, who did the introduction, is a co-researcher of the project, and she's connected with the University of Antwerp. And uh, she has um, a lot of clinical experience, as well as uh, experience in conducting uh, research. And then I should also say a big thank you to the organizations you see here, because they are funding the research. That's my own organization, it's the Zorggroep Multiversum. Broeders van Liefde, and also the city of Antwerp. So the research project started last year, and the first study was a mixed um, method, a systematic review about engagement and assertive outreach. 
And uh, this, the results of this study in, are in preparation for a paper, for a publication. And I also uh, did um, interviews with clients who uh, are included um, with six different assertive outreach teams in Flanders. And um, I asked them what they perceived as helpful and not helpful in their engagement process with these teams. And I'm um, yeah, still analyzing these data, but in the next phase, I want to ask the same question um, and do concept mapping. Um, and I will ask the question at uh, assertive outreach key workers, but also the informal network. So it's family, friends, uh, in, important uh, others for the clients. And this is quite uh, unique because um, this group of, of uh, stakeholders hasn't been um, involved in this uh, topic in, in research. So um, then I want, to, um, sum, I want to summarize the results of study two and three and go with this um, summary to actually the peer workers who have experience in community mental health to discuss these results. And these, um, these studies will inform my fifth study and that's a modeler training of engagement strategies, especially for people who work in a community setting. So that's um, the last study I want to accomplish. And I have um, four years to do this, so yeah. Um, as you can hear, it's still a work in a process, um, this scientific part. And um, next to the scientific part, which was also informed by my own work in an assertive outreach team, I will tell you something more about this, uh, about my clinical work in the assertive outreach uh, team. So I will give some background of this team and then uh, also give some details with uh, the concept of engagement in our minds. So the um, start of, of, of the assertive outreach team is um, actually bottom up because the social services of the public housing in Antwerp um, noticed that there was a significant group of, of residents um, with very precarious situations and um, very um, yeah, oh, multi-problem situations too. So very severe, but that they didn't seek help, these uh, residents. And there was um, also danger of eviction. And they, um, they noticed that the uh, care organizations at that moment couldn't uh, offer help because these clients didn't seek help themselves. So this, this was a big uh, issue. And that's why the, the public housing came to my organization and said, we want to work together. We want to find a solution for these people and that we uh, can prevent eviction and that they can yeah, um, rent their apartment further, but that we also find a solution for their problems. So that's how SEGA started. That's the assertive outreach team um, based in Antwerp. And uh, we started in November, 2011. Uh, so in a couple of months, we will uh, celebrate our 10th anniversary. Um, and our team is four and a half uh, full-time equivalent big. And we also have a multidisciplinary team. So we have a social worker included, also psychiatric nurse, an orthopedagogical worker, a psychologist, psychiatrists. And uh, next to the assertive outreach team, we also have a collaboration um, with um, public welfare team, ALERT, and uh, there we provide actually the mental health um, specialization to this team. Um, if we look at uh, SEGA and engagement, uh, engagement is, is um, central for, for the team. Yeah, we want to try to enhance the engagement with, with clients and we do this on an organizational level, but also on an individual level. And on an organizational level, it's about the uh, alliance between the partners. So um, we work together with all the public housing companies in Antwerp 
and um, we um, are based our sort of outreach team is based in the Zorggroep Multiversum and then we also have uh, the the collaboration with the public welfare uh, uh, organization and that's CAV. Yeah. And the assertive outreach team is funded by the city of Antwerp as well as by the Flemish government. So if you look at uh, the population of the public housing, we see that they have uh, almost 50,000 residents. And luckily, and not every uh, resident needs the help of, of, of SEGA, of the assertive outreach team, but we fo focus really on people who um, avoid care, but live in a very worrisome uh, situation. Uh, the colleagues from the Netherlands probably also know them as careful care seekers. Uh, um, but the main point is that these people don't seek help but that they actually have um, a very fried, fragile um, self-sustainability um, and that it's also very uh, problematic. We um, include the big four groups, uh, diagnostic groups, so it's uh, psychotic disorder, it is um, personality disorder, uh, substance abuse disorder and affective um, disorder and um, Sometimes there, it's also uh, people who have a combination of these uh, um, problems. Uh, we also uh, work with dually diagnosed, sometimes triple diagnosed. Yeah, it depends. Um, if we look at the aims of the, of the assertive outreach team, it's actually also informed by the uh, collaboration with the public housing. So on the one hand, we want to prevent eviction and limit nuisance and danger. But on the other hand, we also want to enable recovery and engage clients to regular mental health care, if this is needed. Um, how do we do this in practice? We have a, a exclusive collaboration um, with, with the public housing and um, this means that we have a shared responsibility. And so if there is a difficult situation, we have to find a solution together. So it's, um, yeah, we have to do it together. That's the, the part of, of the exclusive uh, collaboration. And then on the other hand, we also um, uh, deliver consultancy about mental health. Uh, so, for example, if the social service has a resident who has uh, mental um, problems and they want to uh, have some advice at which services would suit best, then we can think together about this. And there's also um, a constant coaching. So, um, on, on the one hand, you have the, the public housing who has a lot of knowledge about um, services that are in certain neighborhoods and they can provide this. On the other hand, you have the assertive outreach who has the knowledge about mental health care. And um, there's also um, an education part. So for example, at the end of this year, we, the assertive outreach team will provide a uh, training about um, psychiatric diagnosis and also about the professional attitude. And um, we, uh, we also um, gonna yeah that's also important that we meet regularly with with um, the social services so that that we know each other eh? and also in informal context eh? um, this means that we for for example um, share eh, the offices of the social services where there we can eh, as an assertive outreach team um, yeah can can also work and and that's also the place where we have more informal contact and we can discuss things if it's needed yeah so that's on an organizational level on an individual level engagement is a central aim and we focus on contact and and a trusting relationship and we have three pillars um, to inform 
this um, way of working and it's uh, that we work with person-centered care. So this means that um, it's not a service-centered care, but the person and his needs are central. We uh, work recovery oriented and um, we, we don't only uh, look at the symptoms, but we also uh, keep in mind personal and community recovery. And then we also work with um, people's uh, informal network yeah, because we come in their home uh, environments. Yeah, the informal network is there. So we uh, try to active uh, involve these people uh, when possible. Um, here is a, a quote of a SEGA client uh, who uh, describes our work and also as assertive engagement. She, she said, I let you stand at the closed door for almost a month to see if you would come back and you have passed the test. Now you can come in and now you can stay. You can come in my home and stay. So it's, it's actually um, a, <laughs> a good example of, of uh, our work. And then um, sometimes we also come across these uh, kind of situations. Um, so it's not only about engagement, eh, but we um, also have um, these following tasks that we, um, that we uh, take as a part of our job, but um, we do it parallel. Eh? So it's everything next to each other. So um, we want to try to engage these clients and next to this, we also make psychiatric assessment. We offer treatment, case management, risk management if necessary, networking. Yeah. And these parallel tasks uh, sometimes can result in an improved uh, living condition like this. Okay. I will um, end with um, some uh, numbers um, to give you an idea of, of uh, some aspects of uh, our work. So here, the population, we um, have uh, evenly uh, male and female clients in our caseloads. Um, they uh, don't have a big um, income, uh, most of them. And on average, the um, age is between 40 and, and, and 60 years old. So actually, if you compare it with, with uh, other assertive outreach uh, populations, for example, um, for people who are homeless, um, the average age is a bit higher. Uh, they tend to have younger clients and also more male clients. Um, the, most of our clients are single and um, only about 14% of our clients have children, but they're not always in their custody. So this is an overview of our caseloads. Um, on average, we have uh, 70 cases um, per year, and uh, it fluctuates depending on staffing and also on uh, the care weight of the caseload. Um, but we have um, actually about 10 clients per full-time equivalent that we, uh, yeah, that we uh, use as a, um, as a standard. And then, um, you have uh, here an overview of the primary diagnosis. And there you see that the psychotic disorder is our um, main uh, category that we uh, come across. And um, you also see that there's about 11% unknown. And these are situ situations most of the time that we just started and, and uh, we still are um, doing the psychiatric assessments, yeah. We also see an evolution in who made the diagnosis. At the beginning, we were more reluctant eh, to take uh, the psychiatrist uh, on a home visits, but now we uh, see it more as standard. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, the, the practice um, changed a bit, yeah. And then lastly, I will uh, show you um, an overview of, of the evictions eh, because that's also a main aim for us eh, to prevent evictions. Uh, unfortunately, we have annually one eviction plus minus a year. 
And um, in these cases, we still want to want to help clients if if uh, uh, if they can't find themselves uh, a home or a, a, a place where they can stay so that they don't become homeless. So it's not ah, a person is evicted that we stop. No, we try to help these people further and, and see what's, what's necessary for them. Yeah. So here are my uh, contacts uh, <laughs> uh, info. And uh, I don't know if there are questions or remarks. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, yeah, I look at Marionneke, um, if she could um, uh, get some questions from the audience. Yes, um, I didn't see any questions in the chat yet. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat. I do have a question myself. Uh, you said that uh, you were working, yeah, you showed me your study, very interesting, by the way, and thank you for your talk, it was really interesting. Um, uh, yeah, that, that indeed engagement itself is like a complex uh, construct. Yeah. And that you uh, had interviews with people to ask them what was helpful and was not. And, and it's, uh, yeah, I saw that you're working on that right now. Do you yeah. have some, some preview outcomes? Like what do they actually find helpful? What did they say? <laughs> Yeah, actually, um, what I noticed now, but it's very preliminary, yeah? so uh, <laughs> I'm still working on it. But what I noticed is that um, people really liked uh, also the, the practical help yeah? and also the insisting, but not too much. And so that you as a, as a key worker um, show them that you really care and yeah? people notice this. And that's, um, it's a thin line, I think, because some people said to me, you also have to be ready yourself. If you're not ready yourself, people can do what they want. Yeah. But some other people said, yeah, because they came back and they showed me, I really want to understand your situation. This, this uh, helped them to make, yeah, a switch in, in yeah, their way of looking at, yeah. So care. yeah, that somebody indeed really shows that they really care and that they mm -hmm. come back even if yeah, even yeah. if you yeah. Okay, thanks. I, I do get a question here um, mm -hmm. from Mar Margit. Margit, um, mm -hmm. is there already any publications on the subject? Excuse me. Are if there are any publications where you can pe refer people to uh, from your study? Uh, no, no, so all the publications are still in, in, in progress, but maybe um, I can share it uh, through UCOMS or yeah, we, we can, I can do uh, something like this. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, now I get another question from Elizabeth, mm -hmm. if I say it right. Yeah. Uh, what are the main differences between assertive outreach and FACT? So, uh, flexible assertive. Mm -hmm community yeah. treatment yeah. i think uh fact it's yeah the name says it's uh, itself it's it's uh, flexible yeah? assertive outreach actually so assertive outreach itself uh, only works with with this um, demanding population who is difficult to engage and facts has a broader range of of um client population. So it's are, uh, actually people with a severe mental illness who needs a treatment and that they think it's it's um, the best to do this in, in the community. Yeah. So I think it's a broader uh, population. Yeah. What we see in Antwerp is that our FACT team um, cannot reach um, these, these clients, these difficult to engage clients. While um, Sega Project, um, yeah, is more successful in reaching and engaging uh, because they have more time to do it because they have this collaboration with the the housing um, uh, institutions. So that gives them more um, um, more solutions, more tools to to get in. Uh, in the homes of the people. Mm -hmm. I think 
that's a different we see that's the difference we see right now in Antwerp. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's inter indeed also interesting that you directly work together. Also, that the funding is from the city of Antwerp, for example. Um, I got another question from, uh, to see from whom it is, the question. Michel Muller, if I cannot see the last name of Michel. Uh, when the patient doesn't want to talk or interact, how do you make the contact, especially when they stay away from home uh, and when we have an appointment? I think that's the thing. You you first try to make contact with appointments, eh? and you see if this works. If it works out uh, good, okay, you can go on. If it doesn't work, you try to see why it doesn't work, eh? um, and then in the collaboration with uh, public housing, the social services also provide us with information. If we know um, this person is. Um, may be ashamed of his, his um, apartment, we say, oh, but we also can meet outside. Eh? I think that's what Marianne means with, we have um, a range of tools that we try to, um, to use in, in order to make contact. So if somebody doesn't want to make contact, first of all, we think, why does he want to make, why doesn't he want to make contact? And then we see, okay, what solution do we have in our backpack? Yeah? Which tool can we use yeah, to make contact? Yeah. And, and we, we persist, persist in that. Yeah? So we, with some clients, we only have contact by phone or by mail or by post or, um, so yeah, we, we, we never stop. Yeah? Um, when people, when person, people, patients tell us, yeah, we, we don't need help, then we say, okay, here we need to go every day or mm -hmm. try uh, three times a week, or whatever, sometimes without appointment, just everything is um, allowed to make contact with the client. That's our, um, <laughs> that's what, what we are convinced of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I have another question that relates a little bit to this uh, from Jolien. Uh, and then if you look at the the yeah, the total caseload of the people that you you uh, yeah that the the public housing institute says okay this this person we think needs help. How many of these people do you actually reach? Or when she says you get in well, so you mean you really get an opening? I think uh, um, about one to two uh, cases a year um, are really, really uh, difficult eh, to reach. Yeah, one to two cases. So actually it's, it's, it's quite okay, but we also, eh, that's also the, the part of the exclusive collaboration with the public housing. We say, okay, we couldn't reach this person. And now we don't hear very, um, uh, things that are very worrisome huh? so that's a criteria are, if there are still things that are very worrisome we don't give up so that's clear for us but if if the conditions are more safe or it sounds more at ease <laughs> then we tell the social service okay if it's if there are again problems you can call us again so we have that line yeah so sometimes we say, okay, now it's not a good moment. And sometimes it's also, you don't want to annoy people. Eh? You, want to, you want to help them. So if it's not necessary anymore at that moment, we say, okay, we, we, um, we do a step back and, and we'll see in the future if it's still necessary. Yeah. And that for me, and that's not one of the questions, but indeed that it's very well done, by the way, it's just only one or two cases. That sounds really good. It sounds like you're doing your work very well. Um, but it's the, 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 there's maybe then a thin line in when you when somebody feels really stalked and and you're really actually helping someone. How do you determine that? You notice <laughs> if yeah. somebody feels that he's been stalked then you notice and that's also something you you have to be sensitive about if you notice 
somebody says go away then you you're not gonna stand there and say yeah but we have to discuss this and this problem then you say oh that's a pity but maybe i will come back later okay so actually it's a bit uh, balancing yeah 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 okay good uh, mm -hmm. i got a question here from kimberly kimberly mm -hmm. um are people who don't speak dutch or any foreign language included in the worrisome group of people and uh, yes, yes, yeah of course actually we don't have any exclusion criteria good yeah <laughs> yes. people who need help need help yeah so people who um who can be evicted from their house and who suffer from mental health problems, they can be included. And just a follow up question to that, because do, do, does your team also reflect this um, diversity? Uh, because some people might not speak then indeed the Dutch or English or uh, yeah, how do you engage with them? Well, in in the in our own team, we don't have uh, yeah we have the 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 common uh, foreign languages that we speak French, English, German, and and uh, and also Spanish. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, in in the collaboration with the social service, uh, there is more diversity, and there you sometimes also have people who speak uh, Arabic. And then we can, yeah, we can ask them if if it's if it's okay if if uh, the the contact with the public housing is okay. So sometimes we ask them to translate, but also family. You then you have to be creative. Yeah? So that you ask family, uh, other people in the environment, um, uh, local service. So yeah, or we also work with um, translators. Yeah, that are um, yeah officially uh, yeah provided okay. to yeah to the community. <laughs> yeah, um, Marianneke, I'm looking at the the clock here. Okay. Um, yes. Is it possible to go on um, to go further or? Yes, of course. We have, uh, we have we have some time later. Uh, some, some yes, time and I will also say if if there are questions in this. Um, uh, the, or can, we cannot address right now. We can always see if we can address them by email. That's maybe something to do. Okay, yeah. very good. Yeah. Okay. okay, yeah. Of course. Okay. Okay, so um, the next uh, speaker I want to present is um, Luna van Soetendaal. Oh no, uh, sorry, I'm uh, a little bit wrong. First, we are going to um, show you a small movie with some, um, with some patients who will explain what um, assertive outreach means for them. Just a moment, I'll try to start the movie. Okay, here we go. Om de bedreiging ik zie zo licht dat ik dat op uiteindelijk in de kast moet schrikken. Ze helpen me met mijn papieren, met mijn betaling. En ja, mijn ogen nu eigenlijk. Want dan zou ik nog over stof willen. Het contact met de begeleiding is heel hoog. Het zijn goede begeleiders. Bijvoorbeeld ook voor iets uh, te komen maken of iets uh, bij een verhuis. Uh, alles komen in elkaar steken. De uh, berekeningen doorsturen naar de instanties. Papier in orde brengen. Uh, uh, mee gaan winkelen bijvoorbeeld. Allee, het zijn allemaal positieve dingen. Uh, ondersteuning ook. Uh, we zijn tof. Allee, ik vind dat heel positief. Um, ja, je bent een soort redding voor mij, dus ik heb um, veel hulpverleners gehad, maar bij jou heb ik zoiets van, um, de, ja, ik kan jou vertrouwen, dus 
moest even kijken wie je bent, maar je bent iemand rustig. En dat maakt mij weer rustig. Dus als ik iets verkeerds doe of zo, jij pakt dat heel goed op. Dus, en dat maakt mij weer rustig. En dat heb ik nodig. Iemand die mij begrijpt en die mij een beetje kan begeleiden. Dus ja. En je hebt me ook op mijn zwakke momenten gezien. En mij toch niet um, alleen mij stoond gezien en zo. En mij niet beoordeeld. Dus en dat, uh, dat schept vertrouwen. Erg ook, want als een vrouw heeft en als ze kunnen helpen, doen ze het en dat doen ze altijd. Hè. En ze zoeken tot een oplossing. Dus dat, dat kan even duren altijd. Hè. Ten ene mens heeft dat voor en ten andere mens iets anders. Want er wordt altijd wel gezorgd voor een oplossing. Hè. En dat is wel plezant, hè, omdat ja, je wilt vergroot. Ja. Dus dat vind ik er wel heel gewoon. Ja. Een cadans wel. Ja, heel goed natuurlijk. Heel ja. hard geworden, ja. Mij helpen met dingen van taxichecks, alles eigenlijk. Alles van die duale woning. Mailtjes sturen om een bewindvoerder. En ik heb dat alles gedaan. Uh, ik, ik werd nu een beetje beter, omdat ik slaap nu beter door de pielen. Uh, ben ik een beetje nu rooster dan toen. Uh, in het begin was ik er tegen, omdat ik, uh, mijn privacy zou geschonden worden. En nu kijk ik er naar uit. Dat ze komt en dan heb ik toch een babbel. Uh, ik ben veel alleen en ben nu een hele week alleen geweest en ik was blij dat ze vroeg was. Dat ik eigenlijk een babbel had gehad en een praat had over koetjes en kalfjes. Echt naar een hoog. Ik heb daar altijd terecht. Ik doe altijd een vest voor mij. Ja. Uh, het is eigenlijk een verdien geworden van mij. Ja, zij voelde al zoveel jaren ons op dat zij eigenlijk een goede vriendin is geworden. Ja. Echt waar. Echt heel tof. Ja. En we krijgen elke keer een steuntje zo van... Met kleine gebaren, elk steuntje. En dan kik je dat ons terug op. En dan kunnen wij er terug tegenaan. Ja. Dus ja. heel tevreden. Ja, zeker en vast. Ja. Voor jou. Uh, goed. Goeie dingen. Ik vind het een goede man. Mijn begeleider vindt hem heel goed. Dat is alles. Dus, um, als ik iets nodig heb, kan ik altijd bellen. Um, misschien mag dat wel iets meer zijn, meer wekelijks. Maar dat hangt van de nood af, van uh, hoe je dat wilt zien. Maar eigenlijk on allee, ongeveer hoe. Het, het kan meer, maar het kon ook minder zijn, dus eigenlijk goed. Heel goed. Heel open. En heel vertrouwend. Mijn begeleiding is ook altijd voor mij klaar. Allee, ik kan echt op jullie rekenen ook. Hè. Ik, ik, ik kan bellen en... Allee, ja, jullie zijn er. Jullie hebben ook begrip voor mijn beperkingen. En gelijk het gesprek met de psychiater, ik vind dat ongelooflijk. Dat dat een uur en een kwartier geduurd heeft. Ik, allee, dat heb ik nog niet veel meegemaakt in de geestelijke gezondheidszorg. Dus. Ik zeg het, ik vind jullie een super team. Het contact is heel goed. Het klikt mij allemaal. Die dat ik tot hier toe want moet hebben. En ja, waar zo verder nodig. Ja. Mm. Oké. Okay. Oké, okay, so these were some uh, quotes and things that the clients want to, to share with us. Now I want to um, introduce Luna van Soetendaal. 
Luna van Soetendaal is uh, works as a psychiatric nurse in the assertive outreach team um, mobile team for homeless people. Uh, translated in uh, English. <laughs> um, and she's offering assertive outreach care to people experiencing homelessness and severe mental illness and who are hard to um, engage. She will present the clinical um, project and the results of her master thesis. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm going to do my best in English. Um, so my name is Luna and I work in, as a psychiatric nurse in the Mobile Psychiatrist Team Dak and Thuisloze, MPT for short, a Dutch acronym, doesn't translate very well. Um, I'm going to start um, just as uh, Ellen did by giving you a bit of context. So in the city of Antwerp, there are about 700 people experiencing homelessness. There are no exact numbers, that's an estimation. Um, and as we know, both from our practice as out from literature, there's a high prevalence of severe mental illness and all sorts of comorbidities accompanying it. Um, although the needs are very high, there is a low inclusion of this population within the regular mental health care. Um, so logically, there is a high level of unmet needs. In the city of Antwerp, it was traditionally the CAW, the Center for Social Welfare, um, who was the main caregiver to those who are homeless. Um, but their expertise lies in a very different area. So they focus on giving uh, psychosocial counseling. Uh, they help with administration, finances, looking for houses, all those things. Um, but throughout the years, they um, noticed that there were ever more people with severe mental illness frequenting the night shelters um, and the streets, but they, they didn't really know, okay, how, what is the, how can we help them properly? Um, and also um, they had limited access to mental health care because there were all sorts of barriers um, excluding the people from the care that they needed. Um, this resulted in high societal costs, but very little continuity of care. Um, and our social work colleagues describe it as we were putting out fires, but there was never really any long-term benefits um, so the, the local government of Antwerp, they picked up on this signal and um, over the last couple of years, as Marianne has said, they have um, invested in many different projects uh, and one of those was our team. Um, so we started in March 2018 and we are an intersectoral collaboration um, between the social welfare, uh, CAW, and um, CETNA and uh, Multiversum, which are the two main psychiatric hospitals in the region. Um, so they joined forces and they all dispatched um, employees to this project. Um, so we are a relatively small team. We are 2.7 full-time equivalents, but we are very well embedded in a bigger structure. So uh, we, we do what we can. Um, who are our clients? Um, well, simply said, those experiencing homelessness, a severe mental illness, and who are hard to engage. But this is really simply put, because in practice, this is a very heterogeneous group. I hope that I pronounced this correctly. Um, but we see all kinds of different people um, with very, very many problems who are intertwined. Um, we, have, we have very um, young, uh, young guys who um, are addicted to drugs and who have experienced a very bad uh, situation at home, who have uh, very recently got homeless, but just as well, we are uh, one of our clients is a 50 year old man who has been living on the streets for 10 years. So they're very, very, very wide range, very different, all of them. Um, what do we do and how do we do this? Um, so we include clients um, mostly through referral by other services. So very often our colleagues uh, from the social welfare who uh, inform us that there has been someone who is showing worrisome behavior in the night shelter or um, um, the, the, but even the police who uh, encounter someone at the streets who is, looks like he or she is very confused. Um, and then we include via that way. Um, but that on the other hand, we are also very present on the streets. And so very often we ourselves notice Kai Ali or possible potential clients um, or people who we encounter very often who think, okay, we should go and have a look and see if we can try and talk to this person. Um, 
Initially, we always try to make contact in the living environment of the client. So this can be the night shelter, a street corner, a caravan, a tent in a, in a, in a yard where there are horses, true story. Um, doesn't matter, we just try and go there and we also, um, but we do this with the necessary care because it's the living environment of this person. So we um, go there with a lot of uh, respect, no matter where it is or how it looks like. Um, our first job is to assess the situation to see, okay, what is going on? Um, is this someone we can address directly? Is this indeed someone who is suffering from a mental illness or is there perhaps something else going on? Um, and if we, yeah, while assessing, we also start the engaging because of course, uh, like Ellen already said, engagement is uh, something that wires throughout your trajectory with a person. It's not like an, it's an initial stage, but at the same time it goes on all the time. Um, so uh, in this first period, we, we use any means necessary to make contact. Um, we never sit down with someone with a box of tissues in between and say, okay, how are you doing? Do you want to talk about it? Because of course, these people have very good reasons not to want to talk about it. So we just look for other ways in, and this can be mostly practical help. It can be offering someone a cup of coffee and a sandwich or a warm pair of socks, or it can be offering to um, carry a bag to go to a place where they can do some washing and drying, um, going with them to uh, get their ID fixed or to see, okay, can we get you some money or something to eat? So it varies as many different clients as we have every method, it always varies what is what works. But we, um, we keep trying and we keep uh, looking and as was said before sometimes it takes 20 or 30 tries before we can uh, have a talk with someone but that's okay we just we keep trying um, so along the way we try to also look for the question behind the question um, to see okay yeah it's not always easy to yeah to start with the most difficult things that are uh what's really going on inside but along the way we find ways to talk about it and we notice that doing very normal things very regular things usually bring the, out the best conversations so going to the grocery store together can trigger a conversation about uh, childhood trauma or um, yeah things like that um, we are we don't offer treatment in the strict way of the sense so we say that we do pre-therapeutic work and we try to pave the way towards the regular care. Um, what this care is always also depends on, on, on the clients. No two clients are the same. We never have like a, a, a strict plan or procedure or we always look at the situation, the person in front of us, their needs and try to figure out, okay, what do you need um, in your process of recovery? Very often, of course, because our clients have very um, are suffering from very severe mental illness, um, and residential care is needed, residential treatment. Um, and thanks to our collaboration, we have very good access to this to this care. And when our clients do get hospitalized, we do what we call inreaching work. So we outreach on the street, but we inreach in the hospital, and we yeah we we continue to care and we go visit them very often we invite ourselves to team meetings we um, try and plan the trajectory so really as to offer that continuity of care because often it's not just the one yeah, it's um one step forward two step backwards three steps forward so we see that it's really necessary or it's really helpful to have um, someone like a key worker who is just there along the way um, through different hospitals, different GPs, different housing situations until the situation is stable enough. Um, when do we let go of people? When they are um, into regular care and they are settled there and their uh, psychiatric situation is stabilized or when they, are, um, when they find a proper place to live, um, then that is when the process of letting go starts. And I say process because we also do this with a lot of um, care, we can take our time we uh, call this gentle referral. I don't know if it's, <laughs> it works in, 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 in Dutch. We say warme overdracht, which is really like a warm, gentle referral. So we, um, yeah, 
we stay connected, we stay involved just as long as is needed until people feel safe with their new care providers or in their new housing situation. Um, I wanted to highlight um, a rather specific uh, thing in Antwerp, which is Cadence, which is another one of the project that the local government has um, implemented over the last couple of years um, and in which we are involved a lot. Um, so Cadence is a structural intersectoral collaboration between the local government, the local care actors and the police and justice system. Because uh, within our clientele, there is a, 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 sub, a subgroup who come into contact with yeah, the police and justice system very often because they are uh, they um, how do you say this nuisance? Do they cause nuisance on the streets or um, and in the past, these were clients who were often known by everyone. You had to drop a name and everyone was like, oh yeah, that guy. Um, but although they came into emergency care, police, hospital, this and there, there was never like an, 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 a joint action plan. There was, people were hopping, there was no continuity of care. Um, and also there was no one who really took responsibility to, uh, to make sure that that care was implemented. Um, so thanks to Cadence, you can see here in the picture are all the different organizations who are um, working together and it's literally they sit around one big table. Um, clients are discussed there when they give their permission, of course, important to say that people do sign and they sign an agreement to say, okay, my situation is very complex and it's okay for me if it's discussed with these um, different organizations. Um, and then just everyone thinks together, okay, what is necessary here? Um, can my organization mean something? Can we give some advice? Can we help? Um, until a joint action plan is made um, and with the hopes of making sure that these people receive integrated care. Um, and we, from, the, from our assertive outreach team, we often take up the case management for these clients, which means that we keep the overview and uh, yeah, you know what case management means, I, th I guess. Um, but this is pretty unique and it works very well. And it also makes um, things like police and justice system much less threatening because you, we have contacts there. Um, and we notice that our clients feel much safer um, if they have to go to the police because sometimes they get violated, but they're too afraid of the police themselves. So. Yeah, it's been help, very helpful in a lot of different ways. Um, just some uh, data from last year to give you a bit of an idea of our caseload. So 73% uh, of our clients are male. Our mean age is pretty young, 34, as Ellen said. Um, yeah, it's young, but we have a big range from 22 to 73, so uh, all ages are represented. 40% um, of our clients have an income that is below minimum wage. And sorry to say that the other 60% are only just above. So um, they are very living in very difficult economic situations very often. Um, as far as diagnosis goes, I found that a bit more difficult to put on a slide because very often our clients have, seen, have never seen a doctor. So there is no official diagnosis. But at the same time, we have clients who have seen 20 doctors who have been to five different hospitals and who have received 20 different diagnoses. Um, so logically, the main things that we see are people suffering from psychotic disorder, substance abuse disorder, and an intellectual dis and or an intellectual disability. But we don't focus very much on the diagnosis, but really try to see, okay, which symptoms are presenting themselves, what are people suffering from, what is bothering them, and we try to work um, with that. Um, here you can see throughout the years, we've only been existing for uh, almost four years now, um, but I just wanted to give you an idea of our um, the number of referrals that we get. Um, so on average, we have a caseload of about 50 active clients. Um, and every year we manage to transfer around 25 clients into housing and regular care. Um, yeah, we also in the last year have really been investing in uh, giving formal advices because we noticed that we get a lot of requests, a lot of referrals for people who are homeless and suffering from a mental illness, but who were not hard to engage, who were really already had a very good key worker that they connected with and um, really 
were asking for help themselves, but that still our colleagues from the social welfare didn't really know, okay, where can we address them? Where can we refer them to? So we've been also been working on that coaching element, um, trying to yeah, expand a bit of our knowledge uh, onto them to make their uh, referrals easier. Um, as Marianne said, I uh, finished my master thesis in nursing last year, and I did a small, um, some small research of, um, about our clients, really. Um, no surprise that they are very much underrepresented in literature, because of course they are not the people who are very willing to uh, sign an informed consent and say, okay, interview me. Um, but thanks to the bond that I already had with them, Ali, me and my colleagues, of course, um, there were 18 clients who were willing to participate. And what we did, it was a very, like a first research just to see, okay, within our client group, do we find the different characteristics that are uh, mentioned in literature? Do we find them within our clientele group? Um, and can we see how this evolves during our time, during our trajectory of working with them? Um, yeah, so this was some of the conclusions. Um, as you can see, we made, um, we made positive progress on all fields uh, regarding psychiatric uh, symptomatology, um, engagement and self-sufficiency. Um, but our clients started off with more severe problems than the control, control groups and also their end results, uh, in quotation marks, they still remain disturbing. Um, positive thing or the one thing that really stood out is that we managed to uh, get a positive engagement with over 80% of our clients. Um, we started off with zero clients with positive engagement. So that was the one result that really stood out. And it's something that we also feel when we're doing our work. Um, so I think it's very interesting that there is more research going on about that progress of that process of engagement. What is this? How does it work? What do you need? Um, I think this will also benefit uh, to understand our work much better. Um, what are some of the challenges that we experience? Um, yeah, I think it's probably uh, a giveaway, but waiting lists. Um, <laughs> yeah, we often find that once we've engaged people and motivated them to take the step towards care, that that care is not read readily available. Um, and that people have to wait still a couple of weeks, couple of months to get into specialized care, um, which, yeah, which is not helpful because in that period of time, so much can happen, things, situations, situations can change. Um, so we see that it's very difficult to adjust the uh, yeah, motivation and the availability of care onto each other. Um, in that same, um, Atmosphere, there's also a big scarcity on the housing market. Uh, rental prices are super high in Antwerp. Um, there is very little room to experiment with housing to see, okay, let's just try. Let's just see how do you feel in this apartment by yourself? Um, is it working out? Or should we maybe go look for something more into co-housing or assisted, uh, assisted living? Um, but because of the... Um, this, the big scarcity on both the private and the social housing market, we have to take what we can get, which is often not ideal and um, uh, not helpful in the recovery process. Um, as I've said before, we have many people with uh, many patients with dual, triple, quadruple um, diagnosis. Um, yeah, which not only means that they're suffering very much, but also means that they get excluded from many care facilities. Um, we have many people with intellectual disabilities, which sometimes excludes them from psychiatric care or psychiatric assisted housing. Um, also the other way around, we see that many people who have a disability are excluded from disability service because, uh, because of the combined psychi psychiatric uh, diagnosis. Um, so many people with the greatest care needs remain on the streets where they go in a downward spiral. Um, so I think for the future, we should really try and work with all these different sectors combined to see, okay, how can we care for uh, those most in need? Um, yeah, attached to that, we also find 
that we sometimes experience care paralysis and a concept that is uh, put against care avoiders. But I think uh, Lisa in the next presentation will elaborate on that. Um, so yeah, in short, it just means that the care is, that it's the caregivers who avoid the care askers. Um, but we do notice that because of our intersectoral collaboration, I work for the hospital, my colleagues work for a hospital, we come everywhere and we get to know each other and we see that that really helps um, with, this, with this care paralysis. Um, to conclude, we find that engagement is difficult to transfer, by which I mean that even though we try to um, refer people in the most gentle way and um, we try very hard to make that transfer, especially when people, I'm sorry, this is not very uh, clear. When people are housed, um, it, com it often comes at a very random time because when social housing is available, we don't, we don't know it, we cannot plan it. We just get a letter, okay, next month you get housed. And then the process starts of, okay, what do you need? What uh, regular care can we install there? Um, and we see that this is often a very stressful and critical time um, in which we notice that our engagement doesn't translate very well into the other practices. So I think that's also a challenge for our, our work to see, okay, what can we do? I think that's a team for next couple of years to, uh, to work on. Um, this is a quote from one of my clients. You also saw her in the, in the video. Uh, wishing me good luck with my speech. Um, looks like it helped. I think I talked very fast. I don't know. I'm sorry. I do that a bit when I'm nervous. Um, here are my contacts, uh, how you can contact me. And are there any questions? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Luna. It was uh, quite clear. Okay. Very interesting. That's very uh, good. So I look again at Marianneke. <laughs> Um, if she could get some questions from the audience. Yes, thank you. Um, now, first of all, really excellent presentation, very clear, really, and great English, by the way. So it was really <laughs> uh, interesting presentation, so nothing to worry about. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I've got one question here. Um, were, were the questionnaires caregiver reported or did you use patient reported questionnaires for a master thesis? No caregivers reports, only observational um, questionnaires. Yeah. So I think that would be um, a necessary and interesting um, next step. Um, but I wasn't able to uh, include patients in the trial, in the, in the thesis. No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will ask Marianne as well for if, if please give me a sign if, if you need to go to the next presentation. I will just keep on yeah, yeah, it's going okay. through questions and you give me a sign. Two or three minutes left. Okay. Now, I, please, I will, uh, all the participants, attendees, please put your uh, questions in the, in the chat box because I have no other questions, but I do have a question. Um, uh, you said that uh, doing the normal things with these people uh, can trigger the best conversations. Um, but I've noticed that as well, indeed. But how do you do this, and and do you have how do you make space for this? Uh, yeah, and what can you give me some examples? Um, well, it's 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 our main task, really. We don't have to make space for it because that's our key job is to to do the normal things and to accompany people. So it's not like we have to do this separately from our desk job where we also have to have the regular care conversations, mm. um, but we have the luxury of having a very free agenda. Um, so we can plan this as we, as we see fit. Um, and we are very um, yeah, person-centered and also, um, how do I say this in English? Like what people ask is what we do. We don't have an we don't have anything it's not like this is what we have to offer and you can pick one no we listen okay what what are your needs what do you think what do we think can be helpful and we just act upon that and yeah some examples we often go with people to um to their general practitioner where we sit in the waiting area for over an hour with them waiting together uh we go do grocery shopping um we um we sit 
on the street with a cup of coffee, we go get some takeaway, we eat a sandwich together. Yeah. Yeah. We, we look at the computer. Yeah, often we invite people. Sometimes we do invite people at our office if they need to use a computer, they need to make some phone calls. Of course, we can do that in a safe space of, at the office. Um, yeah, that sounds really great. On the road, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I've, please, again, if, oh, yeah, here I've got a question from Elizabeth Hoyland, uh, if I say that's correct. How often do you meet with a standard client? There is no standard client. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> or I don't, um, yeah, so the standard, we exclude standard clients because they don't, they don't need our help. They have regular care where they can go to. So when we encounter or when we, when we get referrals for more standard clients, whatever that means, um, we just try to advise them about the places where they can go. Um, we have very many places for ambulatory care here in Antwerp. Um, uh, so we advise them, but we, yeah, we really focus on those people who cannot get there. Um, who really need to be uh, addressed proactively, outreachingly, very with very much time. Uh, we are very low threshold. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then in that case, for example, yeah, then indeed for this group of patients that, that you really you meet on the street or you meet in their environment and you do their, you support them in their daily life, basically. Uh, um, yeah, exactly. So so those people, how, how often do you meet them? in a care trajectory or yeah. uh, in a week or not giving uh, giving vague answers but that differs enormously yeah. there are people that we see or that i see five times a week there are people that i don't speak to or hear from for six weeks but then they show up at my door and we get started all over again uh, mm -hmm. there are people that i only keep in contact through whatsapp because they are they have temporarily moved to another city because they had some issues in antwerp but I just WhatsApp them and, and see if I can do something at a distance. Um, but yeah, it, it really varies, but it's very intense. It's not once a week. No, it's more, it's much more intense than that. Yeah. Uh, very uh, unpredictable um, because sometimes people are um, hospitalized and you think, okay, I can just go by once a week. We have our plan made but then they leave or they have to leave or there's an issue with a friend which thinks, oh no, I have to be there with my friend at the, on the streets. Um, yeah, and then you have to change your agenda and think, okay, they're here now. There's an urgent uh, situation. Okay, let's see what we can do and how we can amplify our, our meetings, yeah. And does this also mean that you're kind of available for 24 hours a day? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Um, no, we work. Uh, in theory, we work from nine to five, <laughs> but in practice, we do many, um, we do mornings and evenings, but we, we can plan this as we see fit. So if someone has a very important uh, meeting with um, a specialist at, at 7.30, which happens sometimes, okay, we can go with them. Uh -huh. um, yeah, but we're not available 24 seven, that wouldn't be doable. Um, and I also feel like our, our clients respect that very much. I, um, they know that when I can answer, I will answer. Uh -huh. uh, they also know that when I'm with them and we're having a difficult conversation, I won't pick up my phone. Um, so they respect that, I, not always, sometimes, yeah, they respect that. And of course there are within the, um, the services for those who are homeless, there are services that are available 24 seven. So we have a good collaboration with those services as well. Um, so they know if, for example, we've been able to make um, a, a crisis management plan with someone. Then we ask them, okay, can we also inform the night shelter about this so that if something happens during the night, the night shelter can take the plan and see, okay, we should call um, the emergency room or we should call this psychiatric hospital for advice or, yeah. So we try to build in uh, safety nets that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 indeed. Yeah, it's a lot otherwise. This is the last, yeah, is this, oh, we have to go to the next presentation. Yeah, I think we need yeah. to go on. Uh, unfortunately, I need to interrupt. <laughs> yes, no, perfect. I will uh, copy the question of Simona. We go back to it by email. Okay. okay thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now um, I will show you the second part of the movie.
just a moment so I can switch. Het is, het is een jarenlange proces voor sommigen, gelijk mij. Dus ik heb jarenlang nodig gehad om eruit te komen en nu ben ik nog altijd bang om, om weer te hervallen. Dus heb, um, heb begrip en een beetje geduld als je in dit vak gaat. En wees voorbereid op alles, maar dan ook alles. Als ze uh, niks verplichten. Uh, afspraken aankomen. Zeker niks verplicht, gelijk bijvoorbeeld een poetsvraag, als dat niet hoeft, als ze dat niet willen, niet doen. Maar, uh, maar nog. Ik zou het toch ook niet weten. Ja, en niet te veel veranderen van uh, verpleging. Het is voor één ding aan het doen, dat is blijven spreken. Dat ja. betekent dat halen. En ja. ik hoop even voor die mensen dat die het toch die druk ja. geven. Dan, ja. Ik ga die, die visie dat die gebeurd is in mijn jeugd toch terug confronteren. Ja. Voor dat ze het uh, proberen te helpen. Ja. 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 Dat is uiteindelijk niet goed. Ja. Ik heb veel mensen weten sterven in de bekelf, te gevolgen van drank, niets, zelfmoorden. Het, uh, het, uh, nee, het is niet zo van spelen zoals spreken, maar gewoon die mensen toch blijven ja. aanhouden. En je moet er inderdaad geduld hebben en wachten tot die persoon het licht wel water is eigenlijk. Ja. Ja, zeker de mensen, de mensen helpen. Uh, 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 psychologisch gebied ook, ook uh, hulp met materiële dingen. Uh, zeker tof zijn. <laughs> <laughs> ja, als ze veel volk in dat ook um, bestemd zijn, of hoe zeg je dat, voor toch ook naar zo'n worms te gaan, dat ze die mensen zeker moeten helpen. Dat die niet op straat moeten sukkelen en naar een dakloze opvang s'nachts. Dus ik vind eigenlijk zo'n gebouw, lijkt dit, dat er zo meer gebouwen moeten komen. Dat dat echt goed zou zijn voor veel mensen. Uh, misschien een beetje meer briefing, dus uh, de hulpverlening. Um, um, als dat goed is, als jullie veel langs komen, dat dat eigenlijk goed is. Dus als zij zeggen van ja, waarom komen jullie zo veel lang? Maar wij zitten in de problemen, daarvoor hebben we hulp. Dus eigenlijk is dat echt goed dat je veel langs komt en je wel ziet um, uh, of je wel hoort of praat of zo. Heb begrip voor mensen. Uh, niet alleen geestelijk, maar ook lichamelijk. Uh, eh, dikwijls wordt geestelijk en lichamelijk apart gezien. En je kunt ook geestelijk en lichamelijk samen hebben. En daar vind ik dan nog een enorme... Hoe noem ik dat? Er stond nog een i tussen. En eigenlijk zou dat moeten kunnen openen en het geestelijke en het lichamelijke samen aangewerkt worden. En niet alleen geestelijke... En alleen lichamelijk, want het, het hangt heel veel samen ook natuurlijk. Maar meestal zeggen ze dan, ja, het lichamelijke ligt aan je geestelijke problemen. En dat is niet altijd waar. He, je kunt ze allebei hebben gewoon weg. En daar zouden we meer verzorgverleners voor moeten kunnen openstaan. Voor het samen aan te pakken. Zoals jullie ook doen. He. As the World Health Organization famously says... There is no health without mental health. 
So on behalf of everyone, I would like to express our gratitude to you people for your for your warmly services. Okay, so we continue with the presentation after the movie. Just a moment. Okay, so the last uh, speaker of this evening is uh, Lisa Dox. Um, I'm very proud to announce her. She's a psychologist uh, with PhD. Uh, who is working on a ward called uh, Cadenza 4 in the Psychiatric Hospital Multiversum in Buchout, who is uh, in what's in the, uh, in the south of uh, Antwerp. Uh, and this ward uh, offers um, treatment uh, for hard to engage dually diagnosed inpatients. Um, she will focus on the implementation of contingency management as a treatment tool to improve uh, engagement in this challenging patient uh, population. For you, the word. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, like Marianne said, I'm uh, going to try to present uh, the work that we are doing uh, here uh, in the hospital uh, with hard to engage dual and diagnosed uh, in patients. Um, like my colleagues, I'm going to uh, start by uh, situating a bit uh, why, where we are doing this work. Uh, it's uh, Cadenza 4 is part of the uh, psychiatric hospital Multiversum and is part of the cluster Cadenza, um, which offers care to patients suffering from substance uh, use disorders or dual diagnosis. Uh, over five different wards um, and which offers uh, where we offer um, crisis intervention in a closed ward until um, day treatment uh, for addiction and um, dual diagnosis. Uh, Cadenza 4 especially uh, is um, organized into three subunits. Uh, one unit offers uh, treatment uh, for patients suffering from cognitive uh, deficits uh, due to their uh, long-term substance abuse, uh, a unit uh, where we focus on uh, treatment for patients uh, suffering from uh, dual diagnosis um, and are suffering from substance abuse and psychotic disorders. And then uh, the group that we that I will focus on the most uh, tonight, uh, it's what we call the motivation group, uh, which is a group that we started um, that uh, aims at uh, those patients who are found difficult uh, to engage into treatment and who are suffering uh, as well from uh, dual diagnosis. Um, yeah, I would like to start uh, by telling you something about how we started with this uh, work or how, why we are started with this uh, group in uh, the hospital. Um, when I first started working uh, here as a clinical psychologist, uh, it was on the ward for uh, dual diagnosed psychotic patients uh, and the treatment that was uh, being offered was uh, based on uh, cognitive behavioral principles uh, and we were trying uh, to get patients clean and abstinent and trying to uh, activate them by um, letting them participate into a standard group uh, therapy. Um, for most patients, this uh, worked perfectly fine. Um, we saw that they um, set uh, steps towards recovering. Uh, they were get able to become uh, clean and better and they could go back home. Uh, and they um, really uh, benefited from the treatment. 
for some patients, however, it didn't work. Um, we saw that they uh, did not uh, meet with our expectations. Uh, they continued their uh, substance abuse. Uh, they were not willing to participate in uh, our uh, therapies. Um, and they were um, often um, questioning all the rules and expectations that there were on the ward. Um, and um, as a consequence of that, um, we often, as a treatment team, uh, questioned uh, their further stay on the ward. Um, so uh, treatment often was um, very fragmented, uh, was stopped uh, because of continued uh, use of substances or uh, because patients relapsed too often uh, from our point of view, or they were not willing to participate in the treatment that we are offering. Or uh, so, just, so sometimes we stopped it. Uh, in other cases, and patients uh, just left and said, I don't want to be here. Uh, You're not helping me. Um, and um, I'm going um, where I came from. Um, You're not helping uh, me. Um, so it uh, yeah, resulted in really fragmented care with uh, a lot of mandatory admissions and we were uh, yeah, going from one crisis to the other, uh, but we didn't manage uh, to reach, to really reach these clients uh, and to uh, install some kind of continuity of uh, care. Um, so we noticed that what we, was work what we were doing uh, wasn't working for some of these uh, patients. So we um, were asking ourselves, but what is going on here? Um, and um, I think when we made uh, the analysis, uh, what we found that uh, what we were offering uh, was a treatment uh, designed for patients who uh, were asking for help, who were already engaged and who uh, were ready um, to make some behavioral changes. Um, but it wasn't tailored for those who weren't engaged into treatment yet or, or for who, uh, who uh, had uh, really good reasons to not uh, engage in behavioral change uh, at that time. Um, and because of the, the focus on group treatment, uh, because of the uh, uh, focus on um, rules and expectations, there was also uh, very little room um, to um, tailor our treatment to the individual needs of patients. Eh? There was one size uh, fits all uh, mentality. Um, and even if we felt ah, maybe this isn't working for this patient, uh, actually the, the framework where we were uh, working in uh, was hampering us uh, to um, yeah, meet the, the clients uh, or the patient needs. So uh, we didn't manage to build a therapeutic relationship. We didn't uh, um, succeed in engaging them, uh, what is uh, known to be uh, so essential uh, to do our job. Um, and I think it was as a, a, for a part uh, because of the framework we were working, on, um, working in. Um, as Luna said, um, it's, it's really nicely uh, conceptualized, I think, uh, in the uh, interaction between uh, care avoidance in patients and what is called care paralysis in uh, healthcare uh, providers, um, which actually means that the, the um, structure of uh, in what care is offered is often um, not helpful, not helpful for clients and not helpful for the healthcare professionals uh, to really um, make use of their talents and, and is um, hampering creativity and uh, the focus on uh, rules on expectations on protocols uh, is making it really difficult to adjust oneself to the uh, needs of uh, patients who fail that um, they fell out of society and they are convinced that uh, society and for that um, uh, as well the, the care providers from that society can do something for them and so I think that it, it's not <laughs> entirely but it, it describes uh, a big part of what was going on at, at our ward, we, we had our um, protocol, we were convinced of it, um, and if we saw that somebody did not match the picture, um, we um, were feeling frustration, and instead of um, trying to um, overcome the frustration and to look how can we help somebody better, um, we, we 
push them away and we stopped uh, the treatment. So um, yeah, that was really a uh, pity, I think, because it were often patients with a really high need of care um, and we didn't uh, manage to um, reach them. Um, so when in 2016, uh, the hospital was reorganized, uh, we had a, a big chance, I think, to redesign uh, and to overthink um, what kind of care we were uh, willing to, or, or we uh, were convinced of that what we should offer uh, to, for this uh, patient population. And then we said, okay, we really have to do something uh, for that specific group uh, as well of hard to engage uh, dually diagnosed uh, patients. Um, and where we um, were, um, get our inspiration, I think, for how we should organize it. Um, we we um, yeah, go back to um, the um, model of integrated treatment uh, for dual diagnosed patients, uh, where it is clearly uh, said as well that you should, uh, that your uh, treatment interventions and should match the uh, stage of treatment your patient is in. It's, in, it's not helpful uh, for a patient who hasn't had any engagement with uh, a treatment team or with treatment uh, in general um, to put such a client into a relapse prevention therapy because it's not going, it's not meeting his needs and it's not what he's uh, has his mind uh, set on. And that what, what is what we're, we were doing. And I think what is um, being done in a lot of uh, psychiatric hospitals uh, today uh, still. Um, so we um, choose to um, yeah, have a word separate for those patients uh, who were uh, still in the engagement of persuasion phase of treatment and to separate them uh, from patients who were already um, in a state of mind uh, set at active treatment. It was, we thought it should be, it would be helpful for us as a treatment team, for the patients um, who uh, were falling out before and, but also for the patients who were already in an active treatment uh, uh, phase, uh, who also often suffer from uh, other patients that, for example, continue to uh, use drugs or are telling uh, why they won't uh, stop uh, are not willing to stop uh, using because it's sometimes triggering for patients in a different phase. So uh, we were thinking it should be uh, a good idea. Um, so we uh, chose to uh, found a small unit uh, where there was no uh, standard group treatment um, with a minimum of expectations and rules. So we could really, um, yeah, work individually and focus on what uh, an individual client needed. Uh, and our main aim, as was said by Ellen and Luna as well, was on building engagement or being the, building a therapeutic relationship. Um, so um, that uh, was something we uh, wanted to do. And also we try to uh, make the, the waiting list as uh, short as possible. Um, because um, it's also a big threshold uh, for a lot of these uh, clients. Um, for who, the, uh, who do we aim for? It's our uh, patients with uh, severe addiction and a psychiatric uh, disorder. Um, in practice, I can say it's, um, I think over 90% uh, percent with a, uh, patients with a psychotic uh, disorder and um, Besides the addiction and besides these psychiatric problems, uh, patients are experiencing, experiencing difficulties on almost all life domains. So I'm talking about people uh, experience homelessness, unemployment, social isolation, uh, or legal problems. So it's uh, really what you call multi-problem. Um, they have no or little motivation for change or treatment. Um, and uh, it's not possible for them to engage into standard uh, care because of the reasons that I uh, talked about before. Um, I hope that uh, from my explanation now, it seems a really logical thing uh, to do. Um, I can tell you that when we first uh, proposed this project uh, in the hospital and to staff members, uh, it was not something that was perceived as very logical. Um, it was really um, yeah, um, 
questioning a lot of uh, things that were uh, really, um, yeah, I can't find the word, but um, it was something really different uh, from what people were are doing for years. Um, so we, we um, left the focus, uh, for example, on abstinence. We, uh, there was no uh, treatment. What are you going to do with those patients? Um, who and who, what are those patients going to be like? Um, are there going to be a lot of behavioral problems? Um, I don't feel safe. Um, so it was uh, really uh, not that easy um, thing to, to um, sell to the team, but we went uh, through it uh, anyway. Um, and I think for now, I think we are now almost four years, five years um, doing it. Um, I think that um, all staff members uh, will tell you today um, that it's not always easy, but that it had uh, created a lot of opportunities um, to improve our care. So I still think it's a, it's a success. Um, when we look at the opportunities, if you ask patients, um, I think the most heard, heard um, thing, feedback is that you really enjoy the rest and the peace and quiet on the ward that they uh, feel like there is finally a place where they can be safe, that they're, where there is taking care of them um, without that there is um, a lot of expectations in return. Um, and I think it's, it's very different of uh, many regular uh, psychiatric uh, care. Um, what for me is a big sign of our success in, in um, engaging patients is that there are some clients or a lot of clients, I think, um, over the years that uh, we have known for many years and who were um, almost always uh, under mandatory treatment here in the hospital that we managed uh, to build some kind of rela relationship um, and that they changed and that they now come to us and ask can I please come uh, to the hospital again for a while? So I think that's a really uh, big compliment and a big success. Um, and that uh, it's uh, the individual uh, treatment is also uh, lower to frustration from patients, but from the team as well, we uh, made room for ourselves to really customize treatment and to um, leave some of the big expectations if we see that it's not helpful and that maybe it's not um, a feasible uh, goal at this time uh, in the recovery process of an individual patient. So, uh, for example, I know in the past we were uh, really focused on uh, abstinence. If, pe if people weren't abstinent, uh, we often uh, stopped um, getting... Uh, uh, further steps uh, towards outside the hospital and we were really stuck because uh, it wasn't working. Now we uh, sometimes say, okay, we don't, uh, we are not going to get uh, this patient clean at this uh, moment, but what can we do and what uh, are uh, maybe steps uh, on other uh, domains that we can make at this time. Um, what we also have managed uh, because we have changed our care and that we are succeeding in providing much more continuity into care that we also, I think, are a better partner for uh, outpatient services, uh, like, for example, the team of Luna. We have a good uh, relationship, I think, with them, um, which also um, yeah, is, is helpful for us. We know that if the, the treatment ends in the hospital, there is continuity and, and uh, efforts aren't going to be wasted. So uh, it's with the, uh, the uh, outpatient um, outreach teams, we have the, those kinds of uh, relationship, but which uh, yeah, ex assisted living uh, uh, situations as well. So um, yeah, we, we really uh, managed to build a network uh, from that. Um, but of course, it's not a fairy tale. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities. There are a lot of chance, uh, chances, but it's not always easy. And there uh, yeah, are continuously uh, struggles, I think, or questions. Uh, it's good. Uh, it keeps us awake and it keeps us uh, critical. Um, I, I try to uh, summarize uh, the, the impose, most important themes, I think, in the struggles. Um, the first one is um, that uh, here we uh, 
try to uh, think in terms of need of care. So if patients um, or other, uh, ref or we get a referral, we ask ourselves, is this patient, uh, is he duly diagnosed? And do we think he's in need of an uh, uh, hospital admission? If the answer is yes, then we uh, will, um, yeah, let the patient come in and we will admit him, uh, which is a big difference, I think, with uh, how it uh, most of the times work where uh, patients are asked, um, why do you want to come here? What are your uh, treatment goals? What do you want to change? Um, and um, yeah, that is the, the indication for uh, that you can come in or not. So for this group, we don't do that. Um, if we say you are in need of care, you can come in even if you say, I don't want treatment, I don't want to change anything, I just want uh, a warm place to sleep, for example. Um, it's okay for us and we try to use uh, the fact that we can offer the safe place um, as a starting point for building a, a, a therapeutic relationship and maybe we can um, yeah, change some other things as well. Um, but it's uh, something uh, that uh, yeah, continuously uh, require debate, I think, uh, with uh, all the team um, to yeah, stay on the same line. Um, for others, it's the fact that there isn't a, a treatment uh, plan or there is no uh, therapy uh, program in group, which is uh, really common in, uh, in inpatient care it's uh, felt like ooh, really insecure and what do I have to do? I, I feel like I have no uh, control on the ward. Um, what are we doing? Am I doing enough? Is what I'm doing uh, good enough? Is it meaningful? Are we really helping people? Um, so we really uh, have to take care of that as well, I think, and to uh, show people that what uh, the value is of uh, having a therapeutic bond with somebody and of the often really little steps towards recovery or what Luna said, being able to take one step forward, three steps back, uh, but yeah, seeing it on a long-term uh, base. Um, and I think from a uh, framework, it's, it's changed a bit from um, yeah, treatment, uh, cure-minded uh, care to harm avoidance to more uh, care-like uh, center. Um, if somebody isn't entirely clean, but we, for example, manage them to uh, stop using hard drugs, it is a success as well. So that's uh, some of the things that uh, I think we are um, always uh, thinking about uh, with a team, uh, and that's sometimes really difficult uh, to um, yeah, handle it. Um, the struggles also uh, lead to some opportunities or uh, let us be, uh, or try to keep us creative, I, I mean. Um, and I think it's uh, something that also led to the implementation of uh, contingency management at a ward, um, which uh, we thought of as a really uh, feasible uh, tool um, for getting patients maybe further in their recovery process, but is still really a, a low threshold uh, method. It's a behavioral uh, therapy uh, where uh, patients are receiving tangible reinforcers, reinforcers if they uh, achieve a certain target behavior. In addiction treatment, the behavior is always, always abstinent. Um, so, to put it maybe more clearly, if patients uh, manage to uh, give a clean urine sample, uh, they are rewarded with uh, a prize or money. Um, so that's the basic, um, very simple uh, put forward uh, principle of contingency management. Um, it's a, a very uh, evidence-based uh, treatment uh, method. Uh, there are numerous of uh, randomized controlled trials, trials uh, and um, they, that have resulted in numerous meta-analysis who uh, confirm the efficacy of contingency management in the treatment of various substances in various populations uh, and which also saw, show that contingency management is uh, superior um, in comparison to other psychosocial intervention. Um, and it uh, has proven to uh, yeah, result in medium effect sizes. 
um, important, I think, in light of tonight's uh, team, uh, contingency management is not only uh, proven to reduce the substance use, it also reduces dropout out of treatment. Uh, put another way, it's, it might be a tool to improve engagement uh, as well. Um, yeah, I said it's uh, providing a reinforcer for uh, behavior. Important characteristics to make it effective uh, is that the uh, intervention is long enough. Uh, I think what is said in literature is between eight to 12 weeks as really a minimum uh, to uh, have an effect. Um, the value of the reward has to be uh, big enough. Um, if you, uh, yeah, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys, it's here as well. Um, the nature of the reward doesn't seem to make a difference. So if you uh, provide uh, prizes or you provide money, it's not making a, a big difference, but it has to be uh, of large enough value uh, for the patient who receives it. Um, another, in, another important characteristic is that um, the reward scheme is escalating, uh, which means that the longer patients are uh, able to stay clean, the bigger the reward is gathered is getting um, and that if they relapse, um, the reward scheme is reset. So if you manage to um, climb up um, and receive, for example, a reward of 20 euros, euros and you relapse, you don't get anything and you have to start uh, from uh, one euro again, for example. Um, and lastly, um, it's really important that the reinforcement follows the behavior uh, in a short period of time. Uh, for that, for example, um, yeah, working with lab results isn't really effective. Um, you have to have the result um, immediate. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'm uh, yeah um, running out of time, and <laughs> um, so I will. <laughs> Yeah, what we are doing on the word is we're working with a fishbowl. You can see it in the picture. Every patient has a, a, a bowl where there are a, a number of um, cards, tickets in. Um, if they uh, get a, a negative sample, um, they can uh, drop tickets out of the bowl. Um, the first time it's one ticket, the second time it's two. Um, and so on. If they relapse, like I said, they can't get any ticket, uh, ticket uh, and uh, afterwards it just starts over uh, again. Um, what is maybe uh, one important thing that I want to highlight here is that uh, we only focus on the main product of abuse. So if uh, patients are, for example, um, mainly abusing uh, cannabis and they get a positive sample on um, cocaine, they can still uh, draw tickets. And it's, it's really um, important um, for um, the intervention as well, um, because um, yeah, if the, the, you can't uh, experience the reward enough, it's not going to work. Um, sometimes it's questions aren't, uh, isn't this stimulating people to use other drugs? I can say uh, from the clinical experience that we have not now that it's not what we see and it's also in uh, literature as something that is not reported. So it's uh, a big concern often, but it's uh, not really um, yeah, proven in, uh, in practice. Um, yeah, the, the, the feedback that we get uh, with this uh, tool uh, for team members at first, it was really important to uh, get everybody uh, on the same page and to inform them well, but now they really are enjoying well that it, it's a positive uh, way of uh, encounter with patients. It's a positive uh, way of treatment uh, with um, yeah, severe uh, addiction, I think, with, uh, which um, has a lot of relapses, but now we can also do something fun and really um, yeah, show our appreciation for their hard work. And that's what also what patients are telling. They sometimes are a bit um, yeah, in doubt. Do you, are, do, you, do you really going to get give me money? Uh, but if they see it from other patients, they are really enthusiastically uh, to um, do uh, the same. Um, and they um, yeah, really say that they um, find it helpful um, in 
trying to stay clean as well. Um, yeah, I think that's the most important. And I will uh, end <laughs> here. Uh, I will end with thanking all the patients and all uh, the whole team of Cadenza for it. It's not something I'm doing by myself. It's really a team uh, effort and a continuously team effort, um, and which I'm very grateful uh, for. So. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Um, I have a look at Marianneke. Um, do you think if there is an urgent question at this moment or we just handle it by mail? Yes, indeed, we, uh, we do it by mail. Uh, so please, if you have any questions, you can forward them to uh, info at ucons.net. I will also put it in the chat. Uh, oh. And the questions that are asked here uh, in the chat, I will outline them and we can answer them as well. So, okay, thank very, you. Thank you very much, Marianneke. Um, and now I uh, give the word to René Keet, uh, because I think you had some short information for us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. If you can stop uh, sharing the screen. And um, I really want to thank you, Marianne, and your team. Uh, Eric, fellow guitar player, I play guitar too. It's good to hear you. And uh, Marianne, Ellen, Luna, uh, Lisa, thank you very much. And what struck me the most is indeed, um, I think it, it was um, Luna who described that you have this gentle uh, referral or warm referral. And I think it's not only your referral that is gentle and warm. I think your whole approach, be it in research, being a seeing a patient, in your engagement, in your networking with all those partners, with the city, it's all very gentle and also very clear approach. So I really like the spirit of your of your team, of your approach, and of your of your network. So big compliments to that. We're running a little bit out of time, and I do want to have the the guitar play, but I want to show just a little bit. Uh, if you if you like this, and then keep coming back to our webinars, and here you see the upcoming meetings. You also see the mail address to which you can send your questions. Um, but the next webinar will be in December, the 5th of December, and I will organize that all e-health within the context of community mental health. Then in January, the Norwegian group uh, from Sandnes, also present this evening, will present on uh, prevention. And we plan again in May to have an on-location meeting, so we can maybe travel by then again, if Corona allows it. Then we can also meet in Krakow in uh, Poland. So um, that's the upcoming events of UCOMS and then the other event on the Dutch International Mental Health Hub. We plan to do a webinar in December. The date will be announced later on, but that's on the international perspective on the implementation of the United Nations conventions uh, in the context of the pandemic and then the focus on children, so the rights of the child. Um, and you can mail us, you can mail uh, UCOMS, you can mail you your mail address here. So keep coming, keep sending your feedback on this because we want to learn together. And having said that, I thank you again that you were with us this beautiful summer evening, at least in this part of, of Europe, it definitely is. I'll stop sharing and give the word back to Marianne. Thank you very much, uh, René. Thank you all for uh, joining us tonight. I um, especially want to thank again Ellen and Luna and Lisa and Eric here uh, staying with me. And also I want to thank all the clients um, who worked uh, together with us uh, also in the movie. Um, before Eric plays uh, the last song for us, I want to close uh, the webinar with this quote, uh, difficult roads often lead to beautiful destinations. Thank you very much.